morning. No other way. We're going to be reading of First John chapter 1. Thank you, Jesus. How about chapter 3? I wrote it down wrong again. I don't have to have my, you do my notes. <laughs> chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Okay? So as to behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Yeah. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Talking about Christ. As Christ is pure, we are to purify ourselves. As Christ is pure, we are to purify ourselves. And I want to talk to you about that, that there's no other way. There's no other way. And John 14 and 6 is another scripture we'll go to. John 14 and 6. Praise the Lord. John 14 and 6. And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So there's no other way, and Jesus says it himself. There's no other way except through Christ Jesus. And I hear a lot of different ways that people want to come up, but the scripture is clear that Jesus is the only way. He's the only one that died for you. He's the only one that was accepted the Father. He's the only one that we can come to and, and follow after to where we're going to get to where we need to be going. Because it's him that we should be the reflection of him. He's not the reflection of us. We're the reflection of him this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. In Matthew 6 and 33, give you a few verses and then we'll preach. Matthew 6 and 33. This is what he wants us to do. We are to do these things. But Matthew 6 and 3. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Seek God and his righteousness. Yeah. Purify yourself. In the first John it said, purify yourself as he is pure. Yeah. He purified himself. He gave himself. He was crucified on the cross. He brought everything and nailed it to the tree. There's nothing that should hold us back. Let me tell you where this message comes from. Because this message the Lord impressed upon me was the word immediate. Immediate. I'm not, that's not in my notes, but I'm, this is where it came from. There's a lot of times when we're waiting for a certain pattern or a certain way to get somewhere, and God wants to transform us now. In the moment, he wants to transform us. You say, but wait, I've got to spend 20 or 30 years but he tells us what to do to seek him first. He doesn't tell us that we have to go and follow the pattern of somebody else's life, but we can claim it by faith. We can step in faith and be completely fooled. There are people who come to Christ and, and immediately, God changes them immediately. They're a different person. And so many of us struggle through the years. Sometimes we do okay for a while, and then we start struggling and struggling, and we get caught up in this thing of struggle that we don't really pray in, in faith. We pray that he is the one that's going to give it to us, but we don't expect it now. The Bible says now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But you can take that word now and say now, now, today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Now, now, now. It's time that we step into a different type of faith than we've ever stepped before to experience what God wants to do. I'm not going to wait a lifetime sitting here for another 30 or 40 years waiting for God to do something, but I'm going to step into that faith, into the now, and believe God for it now. Clayton needs a healing now, not next week. Adele needs a healing now, not next week. Linda needs a healing now. Lyman needs a healing now. There are numerous ones. Pat needs a healing now. Yeah. Now. 
And when your faith begins to arise to that place, God's going to begin to uh, uh, meet you at that place. He's already done all things in and through Christ Jesus. We don't have to wait. I don't know where we ever learned to wait like that. There is some waiting in people's lives, but it's not for everybody in every situation. And we've learned to wait. Well, I gotta wait. I gotta wait. Why? Why you gotta wait? If you're praying for something, why you gotta wait? What's, what's gonna make the difference? Believe and expect it. That's the difference. Believe and expect it. Don't get caught up in, well, he's gonna do it someday. He might do it, because that's usually the, the next fallback. He might. Or maybe he will. Oh, I don't think he's going to do it. Think about it. Your faith begins to move. But if you stay and say, you know what? Now. Right now in the name of Jesus, God. Your word says it, God. And I declare your word today, God. And I hold you, God, at your word. As you require me to speak your word, God. To speak to the mountain that it would be removed, God. You require that of me. And I'm going to do that, Lord. Because I want a now miracle. I want a now experience. I don't want something year after year after year. And then we look back and say, oh man. God, if I would have just done it 20 or 30 years ago. How about just doing it today? Doing it now. And say, now I believe. I heard a story yesterday, and I was going to share it earlier, but I'm glad I didn't, because the Lord reminded me now. And Sister Judd, which is pastors at Lyndon Peters, she stood up and testified, and she told about her father. She said when she was a little girl, her and her mother went to church out there in Lyndon Peters, where they've been pastoring for 40 years now. Uh, that's Sister Judd. But anyway, her father wanted to go to church with her that morning. And they go, <laughs> we don't want you to go to church. He was always... She said he was a drunk, and so he drank, and he was barely standing up, so he wanted to go to church. So they're thinking he just wants to go to church. So he goes, no, you're not going to church with us today. You know, we don't want to be embarrassed or anything. We don't want you to go to church with us. I'm assuming that's what it is. She didn't say that. But I would assume so, because my father went to church with me when I was seven, and he kind of embarrassed us, but he went to church. But anyway, without getting on that story. Anyway, so she said that, um, so they came to church, and here he was. And she said, and all of a sudden, the music started playing. And this man who was just into himself and an alcoholic went to the front and he was down in the altars and he was weeping for, before God. And they said in that moment of time there was no more smoking, there was no more drinking, there was no more cursing. God transformed him. God changed him there. Why are we waiting? Why do we feel like there has to be something a little bit different? Jesus did enough. It was enough what Jesus did at the cross. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall come to pass. All these things, these things can be for you today when you believe and I'm um, going to seek God with your whole heart. God will reward you. He wants to move us into a place of faith. We're living in, in a different time, in a different place. And God wants to move us into faith. We don't have another 40 years, I don't believe. I don't believe we have, we, we may be here for a hundred years, but we don't have another 40 years anyway. It's time that we rise up as a church and we get serious with God and we go to God and trust God. It's when we come together, this is not to forsake those, those assemblies of God. When there's an assembly of God, we need to be there. We need to be in church. We need to be at the different things that we're coming together for. Like David said, you're not going to come into a place and get what you get here. And that's just the way it is. And when somebody attends another church and the Spirit of God is there and the Word of God is true, they cannot experience anything. But what is there? You can listen all day long. I used to listen to Jimmy Swaggart when I was in the Marine Corps and I was just as lost as lost could be. It didn't do anything for me. It wasn't that the man wasn't anointed at the time. It wasn't that it wasn't a bad, a bad message. It didn't do anything for me. But when I come into the presence of God, into a place to where my mind is set and I come here for the the purpose to worship and lift up the name of Jesus. Then the Spirit of God rests upon us and he begins to hover over as the Spirit of God hovered over the sea, over the waters it talks about in Genesis. He hovers over his people in the house of God where there's a gathering and he begins to move in a mighty way and he moves situations and he, he burns circumstances in that moment. He brings peace and he brings a calm. He brings assurance. Whatever you have, it's time that we quit looking at other places for those assurances and or places of peace or running somewhere else to where we're struggling with it and not coming to the house of God or getting up on our knees somewhere and declaring, God, I'm coming to you because it's you and you alone that I trust. It's you and you alone where salvation comes from. It's you and you alone where my healing is. It's you and you alone that is coming back for me one day soon. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I magnify you today, God. I lift you up today, Jesus. God, you are worthy of praise and honor and glory, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's look at James. Let's go to James chapter 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to establish some principles this morning that we all heard and we all know. But I still hear every week, week after week after week. I just can't get into the Word. I just can't get into the Word. There's time that we, we can't get into the Word. We need to throw every book in the house and shut off the TV and shut down the computer and shut off the phone and sit there before the Word and let the Holy Spirit speak to you about the Word. And I guarantee, I guarantee, I guarantee it that you're going to be sitting there and pretty soon time is going to be flying. I've spent eight hours and beyond just sitting there so engulfed in the Word of God because it just begins to unfold and you're reading and reading. It's like, like, well, where does it say that? Let me go over here and look at the dictionary. Let me go over here and look at the strong concordance. Holy Spirit doesn't need a concordance. He doesn't need a dictionary. Holy Spirit will tell you, hey, go over here and look over here. Go over here and look over here. And I'm just actually going like this sometimes, flipping pages and reading that and going back and reading a little bit deeper and go a little, and read a little bit deeper. Pretty soon that truth of that one little verse all of a sudden begins to light up like I've never seen it before. And all of a sudden my mind begins to embrace that truth and my heart begins to grip a hold of it and it begins to change me. It causes me to, to stand. It causes me to, to, to move the struggle away and get past everything and just trust in God is what I hear over and over. Trust in God. The Holy Spirit would tell you today, trust God. Get into the Word. Trust God. Get on your knees and pray. Or pray when you're going down the road. Pray without ceasing. You say you sound like a broken record and you're just stuck in this comfort place to where you go back to the Scripture. But God is saying to the body of Christ today, pray and read my Word. That's the only thing that's going to make a difference. That's the only thing that's going to make a difference. is when you surrender to God and when the Word of God begins to be part Part of your life. That's when the situation circumstances are going to change and not before. Just put it in put it in English a little bit. When people were in town, talk about in scripture, when people were in town, like the woman that was in there that had the 13 years, the issue of blood, for 13 years, what made the difference? When Jesus came to town. When the word came to town. Jesus is the word. John says in, in the first verse, or first, it says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And if you go down to verse 14, I believe it is, it says, and the word became, became flesh and dwelt among us, talking about, we handled him, we touched him, talking about Christ. He is the word. He's the written word of God. He's the manifestation of God. What we see when we look at the in the Bible and we see Jesus that's walking through and demonstrating, he's not doing anything. He says, I don't do anything unless the Father tells me. It's his word. Yeah. It's his word. Every example and everything that he did was because he was the word becoming alive. He showed it as he walked through through everywhere that he went. They recognized that he was the only way. Only you know the truth. That's what they told him. Only you know, Lord. If there's not you, there's no other. And they spoke these things because they walked with Jesus. They knew Jesus. He was the Word and is no different. We have it on pages here. And it's the Holy Spirit that inspires it for us or, or protects it and, and brings it alive for us. But it's time that we get into the Word where it's part of your life. It's got to be something that you eat up every single day. It's got to be part of your diet. If it ain't part of your diet, then something's wrong. I'm on a, not on a diet, but I'm cutting my sugar up from last week because I told you I was going to make some drastic changes. And I was tired of my feelings of going up and down emotionally because I was eating so much sugar. And I'm not preaching against sugar. I'm saying for me, I knew that what it was doing, it was time to move away from it a little bit and get cleared up. And so that's what I've been doing this week because there's things that we have in our life that affect our spiritual life that are from the natural life. And I wanted to get that out of the way because sometimes I don't feel good. Sometimes I don't feel like going to pray. Sometimes I don't feel like reading the word because I'm not feeling good physically and it affects me emotionally emotionally and every other way and I want to remove every single thing that will separate me from God. I want to see God in his fullness and not I'm trying to reach a place in, but the, the scripture that we read in the beginning was he we are to be pure we're to purify ourselves. I'm purifying myself just not in the physical but I'm purifying myself could affect every area of my life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Those are the things that we ignore. Things that we allow in our lives. 
Things that pull us down. How many of you struggle with, don't raise your hand, but how many of you struggle with watching television too many hours or, or on the internet or watching or on look searching for things and stuff like that and so focused on something? What does that steal from you? Think about that. The time factor. What does it steal from you? We're all guilty, I think, at some point, you know, not every day maybe, but in some days we're all guilty of that. We get caught up in a story, and we start chasing that story. We've had the politics, we have, we've had all the pandemic and everything else that tries to pull us. Everything's trying to pull us another direction, and we need to come back to the truth and know what the truth is. I was talking to my, my brother this morning, and we were talking about the truth, and I don't remember, I remember who said it, but I can't remember his name, but one of the things he said, he goes, truth is the truth, but everything else is opinion. That means everybody has opinion. This is the only truth that we have, and if it doesn't align with this truth right here, then it becomes your opinion. Think about that. And if we can really live that way through this life, and we can live that way, that God, your word is your word, and I trust you, God, and I rely upon you, and I'm counting on you, God, for this life, to live this life, and be all that I can be, God. There's prosperity in serving God. You say, oh man, am I going to be a millionaire? Am I going to have this fancy car? That's not prosperity. Prosperity is what's in a man's heart. That's prosperity when he has Christ in his heart. I remember talking to Cheryl's uncle here uh, long, quite a while now. He's passed away, and he was a self-made millionaire. I mean, he he had some buku boxes, he had owned properties all over, and everything like that. And he he made this statement to me, and it just rang out so loud to me that day in that moment. He wasn't even making a point, but he just like stopped me in my tracks. He goes, "Lynn, do you know how many times I've been broke? A millionaire with all these properties and all these things and all these businesses." He had what down in Ventura or somewhere down there. He had that big three-story hotel. I mean, it was huge. You know how many times I've been broke? He goes, but I'll tell you what. The same thing that got me rich the first time is the same thing I used again. He never stayed down broke. You say, well, what does that have to do with here? If you get the riches of the Word of God and the wisdom of the Word of God in you, you're never going to be broke. You may not have the means sometimes that you want to have, but you're never going to be broke. Because the thing about it is, whatever you have in your heart, and that's able to arise to the occasion to bring you back prosperity, whether it's peace, whether it's healing, whatever it is, you have it within you. And when you plant the word of God in your heart, in your spirit, that's what's going to rise up. And it don't matter if I'm crippled, it don't matter if I'm dragging on the ground, it don't matter if I'm bedridden or whatever it happens to be, I'm still going to be rich. I am rich because the means are in me, and that is Christ Jesus. We need to live that way every day. I see so many broken churches today that are just living, kind of just walking along, limping along, struggling along. When we may have a physical element outside, we walk like that, but inside should not reflect what our outward man's doing. Because the Bible says that we are going, this body's going to decay. We're all going to go to the grave. We're all going to die. But yet I want to be rich here in my spirit and have God in there that I can speak the words of life. Because maybe I'll be the one walking around broken, but let me be able to speak in that condition the word of God unto you. That healing comes to you. Whether it came to me or not, it would come to you. There were many uh, evangelists and many great miracle workers. If you go back into their time, they were broken, they were bedridden, they had death uh, at, at the door. Kenneth Hagin was one of them. Um, uh, Billy Graham, not Billy Graham, but Oral Roberts was another one. He was bedridden, I think, till he was 12 years old. And God raised these people into mighty because he wasn't bankrupt inside of his spirit. He knew the things of God, and he could still lay hands on, but I'm sure the devil came. Remember when you were a kid? Remember when you were sick and how long you were down? And he would say, no, but I know what the Word of God says, and I know it to be true. And whether it shows a reflection of me here, I'm going to declare it by the Word in my mouth and the belief in my heart that he is Lord over all things. This morning, I'm still trying to get to James. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yet God called me who I am. And I'm praying that he makes me better. Lord, this is what you got so far. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's hard to stop 
when you're flying down the highway about 100 miles an hour, it's, it's hard to stop and, and make sure you got the right off ramp. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of here. When I'm reading scripture, sometimes I'm going, 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 and then I got to come back to here. And it's just like, okay, now it's, it's, it, I got to back up, make sure I didn't miss my turn. But anyway, James, talking in here, chapter 1. We're going to be reading verse 22 through 25. <clears throat> This goes a little bit deeper here. And I want you to listen to the principles that are being spoken about here, as well as the truth. But it says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. To look at that with clarity, it says, Be a doer of the word. Don't just read it. Don't just hear me preach it today and you go do nothing with it. It has to become a practice of it. You have to walk it out. You have to experience. I was talking to my brother this morning as well. And I was, I would tell him, you know, you, if you don't have any experience, you're just telling somebody else a story. And when times come against her, or somebody challenges you on that truth, you don't have the means to stand up and defend it. That's right. So it's important that we make it a part of us. So it says, but ye, but be ye doers of the word, of the word, and not hearers only, not just hearing your own, because what you're doing is you're deceiving yourself. Amen. And I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, and I even said it this morning talking to him again, because we were kind of talking around this, and the thing about it is, is we have to understand that there are things that we have heard in our lifetime, and a way that we worship God, and the way that we, we uh, embrace truths, and a lot of those times, if those were not your truths, or those were not, um, I don't care if they took it from the Word of God, but if they, didn't, if they took it from the Word of God and you didn't practice it, then it does you no good. It doesn't matter if the guy's a scholar. It doesn't matter what degree he has. It doesn't matter who's standing up here before you. What matters is that you have experienced what he's bringing. And I've said this many times, but Pastor Robertson, but Pastor Robertson was here for a lot of years. I was 16 years up, uh, up north underneath Brother Robertson. And I was here for about 25, maybe 30 years under Brother Robertson here. That's a long time to be under that kind of a man of God. But I'll tell you what, it wasn't enough to keep me, to protect me, to cause me to have faith. I had to get it, known it myself. It wasn't enough. He spoke powerful words. He spoke revelation. He moved in the gifts of the Spirit. He cast out devils. I've seen all of those things in this man's ministry, and I'm not lifting him up here, but I'm saying how shameful it is because I sat there for all those years and missed so many things. I would love to be able to sit down for one message today and listen and just drink it and drink it and drink it and eat everything that he's speaking because I knew that he was a man of God because he demonstrated it. Because he just didn't say it. He did it. Praise the Lord. So he goes in verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. How many times have you been there? We've all been there. We heard the message as long as we were there when the preacher was preaching or, or when we first came into that one truth. It was like, wow, that's good. I'm going to go home and do that. And then as soon as we step away from the mirror, as soon as we step away from something to remind us again, then what happens? We don't do what the Word of God said. We forget that. And so we can't, we can't prosper. We can't grow. We have to be in the Word of God. And it has to be a practice. It's not enough to go to school and learn a trade until you go out and experience that. There were some things that I knew, and I was able to go past the contractor's test in concrete, with them with flying colors without a problem and, and pass the law and all the, the different things that I needed to do. I was able to do that. But until I got out there and experienced, I became a better concrete guy. I was just a glorified finisher that knew some things because I had experienced and been around some people. But now it was time for me to, to walk in. It was me to call the shots. It was me to fix those discrepancies and those situations that face problems and people that I had never faced before. 
because a lot of times we're under a cover and we're protected when we're, we're under somebody and they make the choices and the decisions and it's easy but when you got to step up and if you don't have enough to bring to the table you better start getting some experience and we did and we weren't afraid to do things there was one particular time I was walking with a guy who was my foreman at the time and he goes have you ever done this before I go no we just made a contract did you ever do this before no I said I do concrete I can do this we did it. We figured it out. We did it. We didn't waste time. We got it done. We have enough ex enough experience to get out into the water, and it made us stronger and more powerful. When when our business failed and I had to have it float around a little bit, one guy called me up. He goes, "Have you ever lifted up a house before?" One of you come up and lift up his house. His house is eighty five years old. I go, "Well, no, I've lifted up a car before." Well, I was a mechanic for the first fifteen years. I did concrete. So I went over and I lifted that house up. I had that house up in the air. And I tore, hand tore all of that with a sledgehammer. All of the concrete all the way around and put a new foundation under it. And he liked the job so well. I'm patting myself on the back and saying I was able to do that because I had some type of experience. But I wouldn't have been able to go across the street with the confidence if I had not tried and attempted with what I did know. But I worked it out to where I was confident. Somebody calls me today, can you lift up my house? No, I'm too old. But anyway, <laughs> but the thing about it is, yes, I know, I know how to do it. I probably have to hire some young guys, but we can get it done without a problem. This was this, these were houses that had they weren't a, a, a sheetrock; they were that plaster. And anybody knows plaster? When you lift up plaster, you got to go up evenly because even if you get a little half of this much in a long way, it just cracks all the inside. We were able to successfully do that, get that house done. But anyway, I'm just making a point. But we have to be doers. We have to take what God has given us. And many of you, many of you, many of you are seasoned. I think everybody can look around here. All of you are seasoned at some point. But God wants you to go a little bit deeper. God wants to take what you've got and wants you to increase on those things and begin to build to where you're walking in confidence. You should be broadening your tent stakes continuously. Remember the thing about Jezebel? Or not Jezebel. Uh, Jabez. Jezebel. Jabez, they had that thing and everybody was running, they were having uh, fast and they were having prayers and they were having this and having that. What happened to that move? What happened to that move? Think about it. People declare it, but they don't want to do it when the times get tough. It's difficult. They just don't have the energy and don't have the wherewithal to do it. But there were so many, and they so, sold so many books about those tents being spread out those stakes being set out and God stretching ministries and stretching this and stretching that. And I have a couple of books I think in here or back there of that time. But what happened? Where's the church at today? If people would have really stretched out their stakes and broadened their ministries, this place would be packed today as well as other places all over. We want to get there and get excited about something, but we don't have the wherewithal to push it through. It's not fun. I'll be real. It's not fun. It's not fun to be in charge of a project. It's not, it's not when you don't really know exactly what you're faced with. It's not fun. But people like you that is here in Gateway today are more, more than able to do that. You guys have qualities that a lot of churches would love to have. And it's time that we rise up and say, you know what? I'm just not going to stay in my comfort zone of the qualities I'm at. I'm going to begin to reach God and reach out to those around me. You say, well, I'm doing so many things. It's all I'm asking you today. Get into the Word like you never have before. Pray. God will make that way easy for you. A lot of times we don't know where to start. How to do or how am I going to do this or what do you want God but when we get into the word and we begin to pray he starts opening the door a little bit little bit little bit and pretty soon you know and you just step right into it with confidence and God will never leave you uh, alienated or leave you without he will always supply the need whatever it is for you to have to where that ministry can grow or those family members that you want to reach he'll give you the wisdom and the word and you'll speak the word at the proper time and God will be speaking to that heart and then all of a sudden salvation will come to that individual. Yeah. We miss sometimes because of the timing of God. That's why I'm reminded by that statement. We miss sometimes by the timing of God. Because we want to do it, we might have some of the means, but yet we need to be prayerful. There's a book that, that, that uh, I just read a couple pages on it. I've had it for a long time. But it says pray, then preach. Right. That's the title of it. Yeah. Pray. Pray. 
did preach. And the man that it was preached revivals like crazy, but he learned that the power of God came when you pray. Yeah. Then you preach. If you're preaching before you're praying, or preaching your before or not praying, there's no life. Right. You can have all the means, you can have all the scriptures, you can sit up here, I can sit up here and quote to you all single day. Every day, I mean, all day long. I can do that. But there's no power that comes from that. But it's when you get in that closet with God and you, you say, okay, God, you called me, God, and you've qualified me, Lord. And God, I want to step out by faith, God, but I need you to open that door. He wants a humble heart. He wants to be, well, God, you know what? I'm this kind of person and you made me this way and, and this is what I got to bring to the table. God knows what you got to bring to the table. Sometimes you ain't got as much as you think you got to bring to the table when you're talking to God. But I have to come to him humbly. Say, God, I need you. God, I need you to open your word to me, God. I need a word today. God, I surrender today. I've said that so many times this week. God, I surrender today. In the morning, God, I surrender today, God. I surrender today everything, God, in my life, in my heart right now, God. I surrender, God, and I repent, Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, for things, God, that, that I've said, things that I've done, Lord. Maybe there's been things that, that wasn't intended like I meant them, or maybe they were intended in a different way, God, but only you know what is truth. I need your truth. I want to be purified by you. I want you, Lord, purge me. Purge me, Lord. Yeah. Cleanse me, God. Because he's the only one that should show. It's him that shows. We get lost in what I look like. And it's not so much in pride. A lot of times, what do I look like? Sometimes it's insecurity. But if we just push him forward, you're going to be okay one way or another. Because it's lifting up the name of Jesus. That's what it's all about. Lifting up the name of Jesus. Yeah. Okay, let me finish this reading here. See, we're in 24, right? Yes. Yes. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. That's funny. He says, he forget what manner of man he was. In the mirror, he was one way. Oh, you're looking good, dude. Oh, yeah, you look good. I, what I notice, too, is sometimes you can turn to the side and see the mirror, another mirror in the same instant. It don't look so good. But anyway, I'm just being smart. Facetious. But anyway, <clears throat> so, he for, so it says he forget, he forgets what, what manner of man he was. That moment he was ready to tackle the world. He was going to pull down everything. There was nothing going to stop him. How many times did you set out with that with God? You just knew that you knew you were bold as a lion, man. You've been in the presence of God and you're just ready to tear it up. Been there many times. My younger life, I was going to go to school and declare the word of God. And I had my Bible and everything taken to school. And then I would get to school because I didn't have a prayer life whatsoever. I just heard the preacher talk about that it should, and I was inspired and excited. But all of a sudden, the enemy comes down and like, oh man, what are they going to think? <laughs> yeah. That's just the enemy. That's the devil telling you that. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, guess what? Because the word wasn't there. I started buying into it. What are they going to think? What are my friends going to think? They'll know how I was last week. They'll know how I was talking last week or what I was doing. They knew. Think about it. But if I knew the word, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I had to have a lot of startovers in my lifetime. Go back and God forgive me, help me, God. There were times when we took the Bible and declared. Remember the fourth grade taking the Bible to school. Me and the girl used to take the Bible, so Kate came up there to whip on me one day and, and knocked my Bible out of my hand. It was just a difficult thing to do because I wasn't totally but I didn't do anything. But yeah, we got to where we'd go out and read every day, me and that girl. And we, we went to church together. Don't make me some hero. I'm just saying we're a different person when we're all bold and ready to go. And the only thing, like, like Ed said, when the word's in you, you're always bold. You're always ready to go. It don't matter what's going on around you and how bad you're shaking. Yeah. Think about it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had told the story. Oh, yeah. The Son of God, well, they weren't telling their reactions. They had confidence, but it doesn't say if they were shaken. If maybe there was some process going through their mind, they didn't have the Spirit of God in them. They didn't have the Holy Spirit like we do today. They were there with the fourth man who was in the fiery furnace. But what was really going on with them human elements of them people? You can shake all you want. You can quake all you want. But if the Word of God's in you, it's going to stabilize and you're going to accomplish what you set out to accomplish. You're going to have the words to speak in that moment. You can shake all day long. You've got a lot of shaking going on. I can see all the shaking going on. But Jesus loves you. Amen. 
doesn't change the power of the truth. Jesus loves you. God sent me here to tell you about Christ, that there's another way. It's time that we begin to start looking at that because that's when we start broadening our, our, our tent stakes. Because if we're praying and we're in the Word of God, then we want to be able to minister to people. Bishop Cox will be here on the 29th of October to minister. And what I would love to see this church, and I challenge you, in this church I've thought about for the last few days since I've talked to him, I would love to see souls that are looking for God in here. But I would like us to be winning souls till he gets here. It's not because of that. He loves winning people to Christ. He loves praying the sinner's prayer. When we were up at the men's uh, um, conference over there, was it four? No, probably six, huh? six or seven. Six or seven young men that were probably 18, maybe even a little bit younger and up in their early 20s, came up and prayed. And they brought Bishop Cox up, in the, Cox up in the front and he began to pray the sinner's prayer and to tell them what it was like to be saved. And those young men experienced Christ in a powerful way and accepted him. And it was powerful and you knew that it was real. They were just sitting there weeping. Huh, Jess, you were there. They were just weeping and everything. And God, in, 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 a, in a powerful way, saved them. But I know Bishop Cox loves to pray that prayer with the sinner. And we all should. But I want to challenge you on the 29th, make sure you bring somebody who I don't care what, so they can hear what the man of God is going to say. I guarantee they won't leave here unsaved unless they just choose not to. He's challenged us all across, not just in the California, because he's over California District, Northern Cal, but he's challenged everywhere. There's been so many people saved in the last years, in the last this last year, in the churches, two here, five here. It's powerful. God's moved in a mighty way. We can't get caught up with what we see here. We want to reflect souls coming in. We want to reflect transformation. We want to see people being equipped in this place and being sent out to minister to other people. We want to see people overcoming. We want to see all these things happening. But the thing about it is, it's going on. It's going on. It's going on. I know Ed, he ministers to different people over there with the, the sheriff's department. And I appreciate his him. Uh, Nikki, she just started the curriculum. I love that. And uh, David, he's got his uh, karate uh, classes and stuff, and he's sharing the gospel with those kids and stuff like that. That's what it's all about. But I want to see souls in this house. I want to see this place packed. I'm not looking for numbers of people. I'm looking for souls that get down to the altar and get right with God at every age. I want to reach every single age. I've been praying for that for a while, but it all starts with what we're talking about today, being prepared. You may be the one with, with such a small word to speak, and all of a sudden it's just like, oh, I haven't heard that all my life, but wow, I've never seen it like that before. Because there's a time and an anointing that takes place, and you're equipped and ready to go because you've been praying and seeking God, and you're ready at that moment. You're not frustrated with everything that's going on or, or the mishaps or, or all the circumstances, the situation, or the sickness, because you're in the Word of God, and I guarantee it keeps you pumped. It keeps you pumped. I'm pumped all the time. As my wife. I'm pumped all the time. I'm not a person who was pumped in my lifetime. I was a person who was real quiet. I like staying away from people. But this word of God has changed my life to where I'm excited all the time. Am I running around with a smile? Nobody inside here. I'm always ready. You come up to me, I got a word for you. I got a word for you. I can give you a word. I can give you a scripture. I'm not bragging. I'm bragging on the word of God. Because I take this and I put this in me. And I put it here. And I'm, I'm confident. Today I came up here. I, I got this message in there. When I went in there, that's when I got the message. I was praying, God, when am I going to preach this morning? And so I went in there and I sat down and made some notes. Because I know you guys like notes and like me to stay on track. So I went in there and sat down and write some notes. And I went in there. But before I did that, I sat down at my desk in there and I prayed. God, I'm going to pray. Whether I've got a message this morning or not, God, I'm going to pray. And all of a sudden, he began to start opening these things. Yeah. Because why? Because I'd already been loading up all week with word. All week, I've been, I take word. I read word. I just get up in the morning. I read word. When I have a time or something, I get word. I, I live a life. I got life. I do stuff around here. I work and do stuff. But I want to make sure that I get word. 
I want to make sure that me and God can have an open conversation 20, all, all in 24 hours. Because I'm a relationship with Him. I'm a relationship with Him. And if you, if you have a relationship with somebody and you're not talking to them, you can see me after church and I'll tell you why your relationship ain't working for you. Huh? You got to communicate. You got to be real. You got to be real. Some people communicate, but they're not real. But you got to be real to God. You got to talk to God. You got to tell Him. You ain't going to bring any spring any surprises on Him. He knows exactly. He knows your thoughts. He knows the hair. It says your, your the hair on your head's numbered. He knows all that. It's getting easier for Him to count back here for me. But I praise the Lord this morning. Twenty-five. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty. So what are they talking about? You got to go back up in verse twenty-two. I'm not going to take it all the way back through it, but twenty-two. But ye, but be ye doers of the word. Word they're talking about the word of God. But verse twenty-five. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty. And continueth therein. Continues in that. Continues in that. That means you continue. That means it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter how fast you're going somewhere. As long as you're continuing. I learned a long time ago in concrete. That I used to pull up there. A lot of times I didn't want to go get the jackhammer. And I wanted, so I had a big sledgehammer. So I'd get the sledgehammer. And I'd start beating on the concrete like that. And beat it with a little short handle. And beating on it. And beating on it. And beating on it. And pretty soon I would see that concrete go. Yeah. Just a little movement. So I worked on that side. Hit. Pretty soon I got a little crack. And pretty soon as soon as I got that, it just like started coming apart. Just a little bit. A little bit. It may not look like you got any movement going on, but I guarantee you keep beating on it, beating on it, beating on it. Keep knocking at the door. That's what he said. Knock. Seek. Over and over and over. If I continue to do that, I'm going to have a breakthrough. I'm going to have a breakthrough, and I'm going to be able to move that rock. I was able to move that rock and put it in my truck in pieces that I could handle. And that's why that's the way we should look at that. If we continue little by little by little. And I don't know, some people have uh, limitations, and some people have uh, other areas where it's like, oh, I just don't get that. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't understand it. Get into the Word. You should have heard me when I first got here. You think I'm bad now. It was worse. I hadn't read anything for I don't know how many years. I wasn't living a lifestyle to where I was running down the library and, and stayed up at school. There was a lot of words. My vocabulary was better when I was a kid than it is now. Because we were taught how to speak English and how to read and everything. But what happens is you live a certain lifestyle and you put everything uh, in, in a mode of cruise. Then what happens is you lose a lot of that. But the word of God has opened up to me in a powerful way. So what I'm trying to say, there's no limitations whatsoever. You see Louis today. Louis can't read. But you look and see what he writes and what he reads now. Because he pursued and he's doing a powerful work with what he's doing because he's reading and he's writing. He didn't let it hold him back. He couldn't read. And I don't mean that to embarrass him. I hope he doesn't because it's a blessings of God. But he had to get up and do something. He had to go and hit and hit and hit and hit and get a little movement and hit and hit. Do you think he just was able to? You ever look at his writing? He writes the Hebrew and Greek. Not just the words but every, if you know the Hebrew and Greek, when the scribes would write, it has to be perfect in every move. Otherwise, it changes the meaning of that word. And Louis has copied them over and over and over. And you look at his work. I've got some in my office that he's given me. And you look at that work, it's like, wow. Wow. But whatever you want out of life, you're going to have to do something with it. And if you're here, I know you want to serve God. You don't want to live half-hearted. You don't want to live to where you have something that you're just not reaching. That you, because you continually reach and reach. That's frustrating. That's frustrating. You're reaching for something and you just can't obtain it. But it's in your own power and your own ability that you can obtain it. I always said anybody can learn anything if they do it. That's right. Amen. Over Amen. and over and over again. Yeah. I'm right-handed. I was born left-handed. 
There was a lot of things I had to change. School made me learn how to write right-handed. But I, I could move my left, too. But it made me write. When I used to have the punching bag, I used to practice. Right? Left. That fast. I used to go in my garage. When I was about 23 years old, go in my garage when I get off work. It had the heavy bag, and I would put the heavy bag there, and I would just right, left, right, left. And I would spend time just right, left. Go like this, like this, and work my move, just in a real concentrated place. And pretty soon it was fast. It was quick. I could switch hands. I'm not bragging. I'm not using any of that now. But I'm just saying, it proved to me you could tie. When I first started boxing with a Golden Glove boxer, he told me, he goes, you got to put that hand behind your back. And he put that left hand behind my back, and I had to learn how to stand differently. Because it changes a lot of things. But after a while, or you tie your shoes together, because you get your legs too far out, you get knocked down. So my shoes were tied together to keep me from moving, so I keep my balance. So I'm not talking about boxing today, I'm talking about you can change anything in your life if you do it continuously over, and not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer. If it's hard for you to get a hold of the word, grab a hold of a simple one right now. It's leading us in the scripture. That's powerful. That's powerful. I'm learning those. I know the first two. I, I practiced the other one this week. I, I got it, but I didn't got it down, if that makes sense. But I've got it. And so I'm going to have that one down. I'm practicing. And I'm learning. I'm learning the scripture when I sit down. I'm learning in probably 15, 20 minutes to where I'm able to cite it when I'm just, and I've been able to do that. And the, God will, the thing is, is God helps you in that. When you're committed to that, God's going to give you that scripture. And then what's going to happen is you're going to need that scripture, and all of a sudden you're not even going to think, where's that now? All of a sudden it's going to, boom! You're going to speak that scripture because it's part of you. It's part of you. It's part of you. Thank you, Jesus. I can tell you some stories, but I won't. But it makes a difference when you're ready and you practice. Your first thing is a reaction. You're not thinking about what am I going to do. You're going to react just by the little. When I needed it, I had it because I was able to react without thinking about it. Still the same principle I'm talking about. There's time that we look and see what the things that hold us back and say, okay, this is my way. I need to make some changes. I'm out, I'm out for major changes right now in my life, my lifestyle. Out for major changes. I'm not compromising the word of God or nothing like that. But there's some things in my life. Cheryl can attest to this. That when I walk through the house, usually I'm picking something up, moving something because I'm, I don't want to deal with it later. That was never me before. I went to work when she raised Landon pretty much. And I did some things with Landon and went, went places with Landon, but I was usually scheduled out. It's always hard to be there. So a lot of that, I put a lot of weight on Cheryl. But the house was clean, the cooking was going on, all those things. But I've learned to do a lot more. I know I have more time, but the thing you still have to change the habits. There are people that are retired that aren't helpful. There are things you have to change. Things you have to change in your life. There has to be lifestyles because they affect every area. If I'm a procrastinator in, in my upkeep and everything, guess what? I want to be a procrastinator when it comes to the things of God. Yeah. Go witness to that one. Well, maybe tomorrow. No, it looks a little cloudy. Might rain. I might scare them. What time we scare them? All right. Praise the Lord. So anyway, let me read twenty-five again. I'm trying to get down there. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, doing it as well. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Yeah. This man shall be blessed in his deed, whatever he's pursuing. If he is a doer, not just a hearer, if he does them both, then he will succeed, is what it's saying, in whatever he's attempting to do. That's pretty much what I've been saying. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. Let's go to Revelation 22 and 12. I'm going to let you go. Maybe. Trust me, I try. We're not on a time frame. I try not to be on a time frame of holding you. If I got nothing to say, I got nothing to say. 
But in verse 22 and 12, and this is Revelations, and this is the closing of Revelations, that it says, and I just wanted to give you a word of encouragement because it sounds like a lot of times I'm giving you instruction, instructions, instruction, but we got to get a hold of the instructions. We got to act on those instructions. Because if we don't, we're never going to get anywhere. I could talk to you about love, and I could talk to you about the creation, and I could talk about all these positive things and everything, but I have to, we got to go somewhere. God has called us not to sit and, and, and look at everything that's along the wayside. He's called us to service. And we need to be equipped for that service. And that's why I preach at this level. Maybe there'll be one day where we can just lighten up. You know what I mean? Let somebody else preach these messages. Ed can preach these messages. And I'll preach the nice ones. <laughs> All right, for 12. And behold, I come quickly, Jesus speaking. And my reward is with me. To give every man according as his work shall be. And in verse 13 it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And if you want to know what that means, the beginning and the end. The first and the last. So what is that reward? It's eternal life. That reward is eternal life. When Christ comes back, we receive eternal life. And he brings that reward with the works. Not that we work by works to get that, but that we serve and be obedient and humble ourselves before him. That we can look like Jesus, walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus. So where we can win those around us. They're still going to be looking like me, but my words, they will be what Christ would say. My intent would be what Christ would intend. My deeds would be what Christ would do. That's the difference. Is when we fall into that and let God move through us. It's all we're doing, becoming that vessel that he can operate and flow through us. And we have to broaden our tents because our, our tent stakes aren't far enough as it is. But we need him. But we have to, by faith, I'm going to stretch out, God. I'm going to spend a little extra time, God. There's five more minutes that I don't give you, God. In the morning, I'm going to give you five minutes. I'm going to get up five minutes a little bit earlier. I don't read your word and sit down, God, and listen. God, I'm going to give you five minutes or whatever happens. I'm going to give you one minute. But as I begin to increase, then it's going to increase. It's going to increase. It's going to increase. And pretty soon you're just going to be a walking, talking Bible. You're just going to declare things. In the name of Jesus, something I ask you to pray. In the name of Jesus. I take authority over that. Why can I take authority over that? Because his word says it, and I believe it, and I, I operate in that. Yeah. Healing. Can I command it? Sickness out? You bet I can. Because the word says it. And the more that I do it, then God's going to say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy's owning this. He believes what he's saying. He believes in terms of Jesus. You see that? You, he believes. He believes what, what you did for him. He wants what you have, what you're offering, what you're, you're sitting over here on the right hand of me, the right hand of me. And that's what it's about. Giving Jesus, 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 Jesus. Letting my life be an open book, an open epistle. 